Well, I see why you guys did that one. Just uh, close the house there. <laughs> I have quite a bit to uh, follow up on. Good morning, everybody. I'm glad to be here today. Today's sermon is going to be on truth. We hear all these terms today about mis- and disinformation. So I figured I'd talk about it. What is misinformation? What is disinformation? Um, well, there we go. Uh, there's some, some truth here. You know, if you are uh, like my posts, you will uh, be healthy, wealthy, and wise, according to a study I just did. <laughs> Obviously, that's uh, inaccurate, right? Uh, but we see a lot of that stuff today, and God warns us about looking out for people who have not the truth, who are trying to give you that mis- and disinformation. But we have to be wise. We have to use our brains. We have to sort that out using critical thinking skill. As I was doing our, my research for this sermon, I wanted to find a joke. And so I started looking through, and um, I looked through some jokes that uh, Ronald Reagan told during his presidency. And as I was going through some of the stuff he was talking about, I found out that Ronald Reagan, prior to becoming a president, also wanted to be an Air Force pilot. Um, unfortunately for him, his eyesight was not good enough. Interesting. He was kept from becoming an Air Force pilot, but later on became the guy in charge of the Air Force. His little disability became what was meant to do great things. If he had followed that dream and was able to do that, he may never have became president. He achieved something that very few people ever get to achieve, running a country because of his disability. When we pray, and, and uh, one of our deacons here, Al Dixon, touched on it a little bit, it's out of humbleness. We're not worthy, but God uses us in other ways. We don't have to be perfect when we walk into this room. We come in as you are, and I'm glad to have you guys here. But the joke I found about uh, good old Ronnie is a joke that he learned from a Russian during the Cold War. He said, it's funny, the Russian people have a lot of funny jokes. And they still do today. We all know about the Ukraine-Russian conflict that's going on right now and how terrible it is. But a lot of Russians are not on the side of war. They don't want the war to continue. They want it to stop. And back then, when Ronald Reagan was president, he got to talk to one of these Russians who were hoping for freedom. And uh, they told him a joke, so he repeated it. The Russian came in, he said, well, you know, there's an American and a Russian, they're talking. And the American says, well, I have true freedom because I can walk into the White House, I can march up to the Oval Office, I can stand in front of President Reagan and pound my fist on his desk and say, President Reagan, you're not running this country right. And the Russian says, oh yeah? He goes, I have real freedom too. I said, how is that? He says, I can walk into the Kremlin. He says, I can walk up to, at the time it would have been Brezhnev, I can pound my fists on his desk and say, Premier, President Reagan isn't running his country right. <laughs> it kind of shows you a little bit of uh, interesting contrast there between the two countries and uh, what freedom is. God wants us to have that freedom from sin. He wants us to have true freedom, which is being able to do his will because we're here to glorify God and not us. In God we trust, and that's how our country was started. Oh, going the wrong way here. There we go. So we're going to start off with Jeremiah 14, 14. And in Jeremiah, he's warning his country about seeing the wrong things, watching the wrong stuff, being guided by that mis- and disinformation. He starts out by saying, Then the Lord said to me, he's a prophet, The prophets are prophesying lies in my name. I have not sent them or appointed them or spoken to them. They are prophesying false visions, divinations, idolatries, and delusions of their own minds. Sound familiar? Therefore, this is what the Lord says about the prophets who are prophesying in my name. I did not send them, yet they are saying, no sword or famine will touch this land. Those prophets will perish by the sword and by famine. The people who, are who they are prophesying to 
will be thrown into the streets of Jerusalem because of the famine and because of the sword. The exact thing that they are prophesying against will be the problem. They get calamity, unfortunately, when they walk away from God. We've all heard of the the new covenant and the old covenant between God and his earth. There's other covenants too. There's the Davidic covenant. There's also the individual covenant. When you pray to the Lord that you believe and you follow Jesus, he forgives us individually of our sins. There's also the national covenant when we follow God's rule. During the 4th of July, I took the opportunity to talk to the kids at at Area 51, the youth group, a little about what made America such a great place. And one of the students asked me, well, I've always heard that, you know, we're at a crossroads. I disagree. That passed a long time ago. Sorry. I believe it has. But the good news is, is we now live in a target-rich environment. We have all sorts of people that we can talk to and give our faith to, and hopefully be able to pull them away from a very evil force. So what makes our country great then? We see back in the 80s, when I grew up, you had Top Gun and you know, Flight of the Intruder and all these movies that talked about America, and it was always, yeah. Now, I remember watching a show relatively recently where somebody said, America's number one, and of course the other character in the show I said, well, why is America number one? What makes America number one? And of course, the other character, the first character said, well, because it's the best. Well, the best at what? And of course, then the person looks dumb and they don't, they can't answer that question. And I thought, well, how would I answer that question? Well, we put in God, in, on, in God we trust on our money. It's our motto, right? One nation under God. Our government isn't above God, it's below God. We're supposed to take our cues and our morals, not from the government, not from other people, but from God. That's where we take our behaviors from, his example. Okay, and by doing that, the forefathers wrote the Constitution of the United States, which made us the biggest economy the world has ever seen, the most powerful military the world has ever seen. We invented airplanes, cars, the internet, cell phones, regular phones, electricity, The list goes on and on and on and on of what people in God's name have given this world. It's amazing what you can do when you follow God's rule. Likewise, you don't want to turn away from it. We hear this battle right now for this upcoming election, and they say things like separation of church and state. I ask, where do you see that? I've never seen it in the Constitution. So what about our land then? What documents can I show that we should be following the Bible? Well, the Declaration of Independence. It says, we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. They are endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights. The First Amendment, Congress shall make no law respecting the establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. That doesn't sound like separation of church and state to me. That sounds like the law is under God, which is exactly what it should be, under God, not above God. During the pandemic, we saw stores that sold marijuana. We saw liquor stores. We saw strip clubs stay open while they tried to close God's house. That's completely backwards. There is no inalienable right to those things, but there is an inalienable right to being right here. And that's important to believe in. Sometimes there is a hill to fight for. You can't stop God's kingdom. Many governments in the world have tried to erase God's book off the face of this earth, and they can't do it. It's now said that it's been quoted so many times that the Bible could be put back together through quotes. No other book is like this. And even though Christianity may be having a difficult time taking root again in our country, it still doesn't stop. I was doing more research and I looked into what country Christianity is most gaining ground in. 
And if you're part of the youth group, don't answer this question because we've discussed this recently. But does anybody know what country Christianity is really starting to blow up in? Anybody want to take a guess? You can shout it out. Any guesses? No? No, not Korea, not India. No, no, not Africa. Africa does have a lot of churches, though. Um, But in Iran, of all places, a place where it's pretty much completely illegal. If you go to Iran as a Christian, that's okay. But if you're a Muslim and you convert to Christianity, that's a death sentence. But somehow there's more churches in basements, in houses, everywhere else that are sprouting up. That's amazing to me. Where it's persecuted most, it still gains traction. There's a book recently that came out called Anti-Fragile. And it's that exact concept. The more it's pushed, the more you're persecuted, the harder you fight, the the stronger your resolve becomes. That's what happens with God on your side. You may have a disability. You may have a difficulty. You may have to do things in a different way. I was talking to a woman who was having a tough time with her legs and her knees, but she was still coming to church. She was using that as an example to others about the power of God and how she was still able to get around using medical devices. We can use whatever God gives us, whatever the Satan tries to come in and use for evil, we can use with God's power to help his kingdom. In Matthew 24, verse 4, Jesus is talking to his disciples. And in here, as he's talking to his disciples, they ask him about what's going to happen. They're scared of the coming difficulties. They're scared of the persecution. Jesus answers them. He says, in 24, verse 4 of Matthew, Watch out that no one deceives you. For many will come in my name claiming that I am the Messiah, and they will deceive many. You will hear of wars and rumors of wars, but you see that you are not ashamed. Alarmed, excuse me. <laughs> you are not alarmed. A couple weeks ago, I learned of a situation at my other job. Many of you guys know I have a couple different jobs, but at my other job, they were going to replace me. They had somebody making less than half of what I made, and they were going to put that person in my position, which would have put me out of that job. Uh, I knew that there could always be that possibility. However, I didn't know that was the plan. Nobody officially came forward and told me about it. Matter of fact, they told me, oh, don't worry about it. No, no, there's no worries here for you. Um, behind the scenes, though, there was a battle raging. There was people that were talking to the main boss and said, hey, this isn't right. You know, this, this person's been working here a long time. He's a hard worker. He knows what he's doing. He gives quality uh, service to the public. He said, I don't care. He wanted to spend less money. He was looking at the bottom line. And for weeks, this battle raged on, and I had no idea it was even happening until it was over. One of the people that were fighting for me came forward. He told me that the main boss, the new boss that had stepped in, was looking at the bottom line, and he was trying to eliminate my position and fill it with somebody who was much younger and getting paid much, much less. He said that for weeks, the boss would not change his mind and was very difficult about it until that day. He says, I don't know what happened. I don't know if somebody talked to him. I don't know how this happened, but I walked into his office this morning, and he said, you know what? Tell Dave not to worry. I've changed my mind. I had no idea any of that had happened behind the scenes. No clue that any of that was part of what was happening. A battle was raging. I had no worries. I didn't need to be alarmed because God was fighting for me, even when I didn't know he was fighting for me. I don't need to worry. Since then, I kind of walk around with this little pep in my step, just knowing that God's got my back. Does that mean that no bad things are going to happen? Well, absolutely not. Jesus decided to be crucified for our, our sins, our inequities, decided to take our debt. And we're going to discuss that a little more during communion, but bad things do happen. God can just use them for good. And we don't have to worry about that because God will take those problems and turn them around and fight the battles for us. We don't have to worry about it. We don't have to go out of our way. King David was another person who had a lot of battles to fight he had nations all around him that wanted him dead. That's, if that's not terrifying enough, his own kid wanted him dead. I mean, talk about a family problem. I've heard of lots of family issues 
debates and all that stuff, well, not many of us can say that our children are trying to kill us actively. <laughs> In Proverbs 3.21, it says, My son, do not let wisdom and understanding out of your sight. Preserve sound judgment and discretion. They will be like life for you. An ornament of grace around your neck, then you will go on your way safely, and your foot will not stumble. When you lie down, you will not be afraid. When you lie down, your sleep will be sweet. Have no fear of sudden disaster or the ruin that overtakes the wicked, for the Lord will be on your side. I just love that verse. We all talk about staying awake at night over difficulties and hardships. When it comes to disinformation or misinformation, we've heard a lot of that throughout the years. At least that I've been around, I've heard a lot of it. We hear a lot of it in the news today. Even growing up in the 80s, I remember hearing about the scientists. And they used to tell us, science proves there is no God. Scientists don't believe in God. And they'd cite some study that they said, scientists say they don't believe in God. So I've done some research on that. Recently, there was a study with the Journal of Science and Religion. They went through 12 previous studies and looked at how they conducted them. These studies went back to the 1800s. Some of these studies only interviewed scientists at one university. Some interviewed multiple. Some excluded certain responses because it didn't fit into their narrative of what they wanted to say. So they decided to redo the study. They interviewed people from hundreds and hundreds of universities all across the United States, all these different scientists. They gave them questions to answer about science and religion. And if it wasn't something they could plot on a graph, they would show the scientists what they were doing and ask them, how would you like your answer represented? Transparency, it's a crazy idea. <laughs> So at the end of this study, they came out with it, and they even showed the scientists afterwards. 15% of the scientists studied at these universities said that science and religion are always at odds. 15%. Another 15% said that science and religion always agree. 70% said that science and religion generally agree, and that science shows evidence of a creator. So that's a total of 85% believe that science shows evidence of a creator. That doesn't sound like the majority don't believe to me. It sounds to me like sometimes the answers are tailored in a way that will make somebody else feel good. Reading a science book, I ran across a guy called Giorgio Bruno. Uh, feel free to look him up after the service. He was a monk and in the science book, it just simply said that he was killed during the Inquisition for believing in a heliocentric universe. In layman's terms, that just means he believed that the earth went around the sun in a time where they thought the earth was the center of everything. Giorgio Bruno, it says, was killed because of that, because of these Christians who couldn't marry the two ideas of science and religion, and because religion obviously is at odds with science, right? That's what it leads you to believe. But doing more research on the guy, Mr. Bruno wasn't just that person. He was a monk who left religion. He started his own cult, worshiping the sun. He didn't just believe that the earth went around the sun. He thought the sun was a god. He started worshiping the sun. He had followers, and still he was not executed. He ripped off the government and his own cult. Matter of fact, he was such a disagreeable person, his own cult members exiled him and gave him over to the government. People that were supposed to be following him couldn't stand him. So when you look at what happened, the truth is, yes, he was sentenced to death, but it wasn't just because he didn't believe the religious elites. There was a lot more reality to it. Disinformation, keeping you from knowing the full facts to lead you to believe one thing. There's a lot of that these days. We see that all the time. That's why critical thinking skills are so important. In 2 Thessalonians 2.13, it says, In order to 
For the truth to complete its designed purpose, the truth must be received. I don't know if anybody here has watched uh, Pastor Tony Evans before. Doctor, extremely smart man. He talks in yelling, my wife says. He's very loud. That's probably why I like him. He's cool. Um, He says, when you believe a lie, the truth will offend you. That's accurate. Have you ever tried to tell somebody the truth and they didn't want to hear it? Tell somebody the news that they don't want to know, they don't want to think about? Sometimes they walk away from the friendship. That happens. My, my wife talked to one of her friends one time who was leaving her husband, and she said, well, I just have to look after me. And my wife told her, well, maybe you should work on your marriage. She didn't like it. She doesn't talk to us anymore. It's sad because her husband's a great guy. Still talk to him to this day. Um, Sometimes it is difficult telling people the news that they don't want to know. You know, I took a poll one time, unofficially. I talked to a bunch of people that had been arrested and asked them why they'd been arrested and what they did and why. I got some various answers to different things, and I remember one gentleman walked in and he had been arrested for selling drugs, heroin and and fentanyl. The police had found drugs hidden on him. And as I spoke to him, He said, well, I'm just using the tools that I have available to me. Now, those drugs are fairly lucrative to sell. Made him a decent profit. I said, really? Okay. So I thought, well, I'm going to go for it. I'm going to ask him the tough question. I said, well, if you're telling me these are just the tools you have available to you, how many jobs have you applied for in the last month? He did not like that question at all. I think he called me just about every name he could think of. But he did not have the truth, and therefore it offended him. It was a serious question, though. Instead of selling drugs, selling something that damages people so deeply, something that Satan sends here for a specific purpose. He chose to do the easy way out. Something that did damage other people. If anybody's ever seen somebody who's withdrawing from drugs, it's like somebody with the worst flu. They throw up on themselves. It's absolutely horrendous. This stuff doesn't just affect the body, though. It also affects the mind. If you talk to somebody who's on drugs or has been using drugs frequently, their mind is altered. Their worldview is completely changed. They don't see the truth. It can cause permanent psychosis in a very short amount of time. It's absolutely horrendous. And now, I recently heard that drug abuse is the leading cause of death for people between the ages of 15 and 45. No longer is the car accidents, gunshot. It's now drugs. That's absolutely horrible. And this is something that's sent from Satan to affect us, to keep us from our goal, from keep us from our God, to keep us from our kingdom. Very sad. <clears throat> In Romans 7, 14 through 17, Paul starts talking about freedom and the evils of sin. He says in 7:14 of Romans, we know that the law is spiritual. But I'm unspiritual, sold as a slave into sin. I do not understand what I do. For what I want to do, I don't do. But what I hate to do. And if you do what I do, not what you want to do, I agree that the law is good. And it is no longer myself who does it, but the sin living in me. What does that mean? Well, he goes on in Galatians, in 5.1, he talks about freedom. Freedom away from doing the things that the world wants you to do. See, we're born into this world, and we have to operate in it, but we're not of this world. We're supposed to be kingdom people. And in Galatians 5.1, Paul says, It is freedom that Christ has set us free. Stand firm then, then. do not let yourselves be burdened again by the yoke of slavery. He goes on to say that, For my brothers and sisters, we are called to be free, but do not use your freedom to indulge in the flesh, rather serve one another humbly and in love. So I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the flesh desires what is contrary to the Spirit, and the Spirit contrary to the flesh. So that they are in conflict with each other, so that you do not do whatever you want, but if you are led by the Spirit, 
you are not under the law. You are above the law. If the law is here and this is what's legal and this is illegal, you want to be of the Spirit and above the law. Do what God wants. Acts of the flesh are obvious, he says. And then he gives us a list of things to avoid. A list of things that are going to take your freedom away and indulge in addiction. He says sexual immorality, impurity, debauchery, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfishness, and selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, and envy, drunkenness, orgies, and alike. That's quite the list. But it doesn't take long for us in this society to look around and see those exact things going on right before our very eyes. All you have to do is flip on one of these award shows that awards these people who make music these days to see all that stuff go on right before our very eyes. We can see it in our schools. We can see it in our libraries. We can see books being placed in there that mess with our children's heads. It's absolutely wrong. He says, I warn you, as I did before, that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace. Here he gives a list of good things. So he contrasts all these negative things that keep you from the kingdom with the good things that will give you the kingdom to inherit. And he says, love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self and self-control. Against such things there is no law. Those who belong to Jesus Christ have crucified the flesh and their passions and desires. Those negative things were crucified and died up on that cross when Jesus decided to take our place. Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit and not become conceited, provoking the envy of each other. In Thessalonians, 1 Thessalonians 5.21, it says, Test all things, hold fast to what is good. What does that mean? Test all things. We're testing it against this book. Again, here's government, here's God's law. This is the book that we need to test everything against. It gives us the examples that we can follow. If it's against God, we need to get it out of our lives. It's those addictions. That's what's keeping us from that kingdom. And of course, if we know somebody that needs the truth and doesn't have the truth, God does say, blessed is he who is not offended by me, the cross, right? And it's not always easy giving them the truth. You may be a seed planter or you may be a harvester. You may come to somebody and they may give their lives over to God. But it takes both people. So don't be upset or discouraged if you talk to somebody about God and they don't receive the truth right then. Just keep at it. They'll receive the truth eventually. What's a good way that we can give the truth, you might ask? Well, simple. I, I call it the 60-second gospel, but the basics of it is that Jesus was born of a virgin, both fully God and fully man. He lived a sinless life. He chose to take that path up to the cross and die for us and take our place. And on the third day, he rose again and ascended to the right hand of the Father. And if you believe that, you're saved. That's it. That's the basics. Sure, there's a lot more in the Bible that we need to look out for, and there's a lot of stuff and a lot of detail in there, yes, but we can work on the rest of that later. That's the first step. That's the big step. That's the hurdle that we need to overcome. God gives us lots of reasons for that, and we're supposed to give those reasons of our belief to others with gentleness and respect, because yelling and screaming some, at somebody is not going to bring them to God, but push them further away. So we want to be the ones to give that person the truth with gentleness and respect, to try to plant that seed and give them the truth of their true God. We're not doing this stuff for us. We're doing this for God. We're not working for ourselves. We're not working for our own glorification, but to glorify God and his kingdom, because God is going to make this right. One of these days, God is going to fix all the negative things that we see around us, and it's going to be awesome. And we don't have to worry, we don't have to be afraid, we don't have to be concerned, but God says to watch out for all those people that are going to try to lead us astray. Look out for them, be on your guard, and test those things that they're telling you against this. That way, we can inherit the kingdom and we can hopefully bring some more people with us too.